What's up everybody? Citizen Kimberly here. Welcome back to the channel and now it's time for an episode of Netflix and Chop where we slice open and dissect the featured film. Today's feature we're going to be discussing is an independent film, a 2016 thriller named Too Late, written and directed by Dennis Huck. So the story starts off in sort of a Wonderland ambient kind of feeling to it. Where we're situated on top of a grassy green hill somewhere in East or West LA and we're panned in on a young brunette and she's having some issues with her phone. She's kind of like what the heck then slowly we drift and I do mean drift we drift over to two young men and they're having this really deep discussion sort of kind of around the nature of hey what if at the end of don't tell mom the babysitter is dead the mom actually gets a tape of the entire movie and then she would know what a catastrophe it was and she wouldn't be mad to which one of the young men replies gee so you mean you want to have a movie inside of a movie so that they know what the ending is going to be. And the young man is kind of like, yeah. And my thought is, wouldn't that just be delicious if in real life we were in a particular situation and we actually got the videotape of our life letting us know that the situation isn't as bad as we think that it is. But moving on. So the two young run upon this young lady and they're like oh my gosh looky looky here this girl's really cute and you kind of think that these two men are gonna be on the sleazy side which they are to which the young lady replies i'm having some phone problems can i use your phone and they're like sure and we drift on over while she uses we kind of drift back towards the two young men and then we drift back over and we see exactly who the person is that she's calling. And then we float down on a slope to where we can see the person that she's trying to contact and that's when we're introduced to the main character. And the main character, he's kind of in this situation where he's with this woman who picks up his phone and she's kind of a jerk. And he has this conversation with the young lady when he gets his phone and we are not really sure exactly the relationship between the two because the dialogue is kind of broken. At first we're kind of assuming that they are perhaps people that hooked up at one point and then they lost contact. <laughs> then we float down and we see the main character get into his car split screen and then we're going to float right back up to where we see the young lady who is then returning her phone to the two young men who seem like numb nuts at this point. They kind of talk to her and they're like, gee, you know, like, what do you want? Like, because we have lots at our disposal. So they give her a pill of ecstasy and she takes it, which is really weird. And, you know, this young lady, she seems super trusting. She has the sweetest face. And we're just kind of, I, I mean, personally, I was kind of shocked at her taking some stranger, some stranger's candy upon just meeting them, some freaky young dudes that she just walks upon in the middle of the woods or whatever hilltop they're on, but anyway. So we kind of see the young lady talk to these two young men. The two young men are like, we're going to go off and do some business dealings with this ecstasy and other things of that nature, and we're going to come back and we're going to take you to breakfast if your friend doesn't show up. And she's like, okay, cool. So then the young lady drives off on her pill of ecstasy. And while she's using the bathroom, she happens to see a stranger that is hanging out in a tree, just kind of swinging his leg and eating this pink lady apple. The stranger who's dressed in this uniform like a park ranger is kind of like, you know, you're not supposed to be doing that. And she's like, oh my God, I can't believe you did that. So they kind of have this conversation at this point in the movie. They're it's kind of shot like a fairy tale love story and they're kind of it's kind of hinting at this kind of funky romance that's going to go on between this park ranger and this young lady however 
things get really weird because we kind of float ominously down over to the side by this tree and we see that there's a body that is halfway naked with a bag over its head and some flies buzzing around. So then we kind of get the feeling that this park ranger is not really a park ranger. And that's when the movie kind of gets interesting because the first 30 minutes would lead you to believe that you're kind of floating around in Alice in Wonderland uh, circa 1976. <laughs> but the movie definitely takes a turn at this point and it's probably around the 30 minute mark where things start to get pretty interesting. At some point during these continuous shots and we'll discuss this part later because I, I have a lot to say about the way that the movie was shot and the direction and the dialogue uh, to which it took. I thought that well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that later. So sooner or later, we see, the, we see the person that the young lady has contacted kind of pull up in his 1970s Trans Am white car and it's deliciously groovy. And he pulls up and he's kind of like looking around, but he sees that the two young men that previously that had approached the young lady and lent her their phone they've discovered her body because of course the park ranger who isn't really a park ranger has now strangled and murdered this young lady and they think that it's the ecstasy that they had given her previously that did the job anyway they're frazzled and they run off and the main character who is a private investigator sees them and he's kind of frazzled because he hasn't found the body yet so then we kind of drift over into another scene. We don't flash. Take my word for it. We drift over into another section of the movie. So in this section of the movie, we're looking at a really nice looking blonde lady and she's in the mirror. She's putting on her mascara and her eyeliner. There's some really cool going on in the background. You can tell that she's feeling really good about herself. And she goes over to her closet. She puts on this fabulous green dress. The energy that is surrounding her you can feel coming off the screen because she's just really happy about this outfit and do her make. <laughs> we follow her ominously once again where she walks upon two men. One is played by Jeff Fahey. He's sitting in a cowboy hat. He's epically and awesomely the greatest version of Jeff Faye that there ever was. And there's also the another gentleman who we later find out through dialogue and discussion is her husband. And this gentleman, uh, you may recognize him from a myriad of movies, but the one that jumps into mine would be Jackie Brown. And she's talking to her husband and through dialogue and discussion, we figure out that she has dressed inappropriately for the event that they're supposed to be going to. So she she is having this discussion with her husband and you can tell that she is not pleased with his response to the outfit. And over to the side, we see Sydney Poitier and all of her beautiful glory lounging on this chair by the pool and she plays Jeff Fahey's wife. And the young lady's husband asks Sydney Poitier, he's like, Veronica, because that's, you know, that's her name in the movie. He's like, Veronica, what are you going to wear to this event? And she's like, I'm just going to wear some slacks. And you're just kind of like, oh my gosh. So we pan back over to the young lady in the green dress, and she's just kind of heartbroken. You can tell that everything is just, her whole sense of being has been shattered due to her husband's disapproval. And then her husband goes and asks this other woman, what she's going to do like you know and at this point in the movie i'm feeling like this is ridiculous how could this man you know any man in any situation wouldn't i i would hope who is at least a decent husband and and another thing this dude is raggedy he is broken he is a mess and this girl is gorgeous so that's a side note so we're drifting back and we follow her into her bedroom she's there again her makeup, her mascara is running because she is crying. She's ripping off this green dress. She 
puts here's where the film has some trickery in it because this lady is completely nude from the bottom half down while she's having this nervous breakdown there's absolutely nothing going on and then the doorbell rings the husband chimes in on the intercom system and he's kind of like eh, are you gonna go and get that and she's like i cannot you can tell she's like i cannot even believe that he is trying to get me to answer this doorbell after he has disgraced me because of my outfit and it is ridiculous she goes over and she answers the door and of course it's the pi the man who the young lady previously who has now been murdered has contacted and he comes in and she offers him a drink and it just seems completely natural although there's nothing going on down in the bottom and they have this conversation while he's drinking this gin gimlet that she's made him and she's discussing how she has wasted her youth and her life on this man who doesn't care about. and i thought that the ironic thing about this was the fact that this lady is saying that she wasted her youth but she's a bombshell and the thing is you know in the surroundings of where this scene is taking place you would you do believe that these people are wealthy so it's not about the wealth that this lady married this man she actually is vying for his attention and he's rusty and crusty and dusty and and it makes her feel like she is disintegrating and degrading before her eyes it's like really sad um and we kind of get some tension between herself and Sidney Poitier like Sidney Poitier has obviously married Jay Jeff Fahey for his money but this young lady Janet she didn't do that and it's really sad so through discussion and dialogue there's a kerfuffle this lady decides to go ham and cheese because the private eye has decided that he's going to kill these two gentlemen because they are gang bosses and they have had something to do with the young lady who has just been murdered by the <laughs> by the park ranger i'm just giving you a general overview and kind of like the plot analysis and little things that i feel like are really interesting to look at and interesting to note then we kind of we move on over a section of the movie where we discover the beginnings, the P.I., and the young lady's relationship. The young lady is a stripper, the P.I. is in the strip club, and they meet each other. But not before a series of unfortunate events, some, some really jarring and eye-punching dialogue between himself and another character who actually winds up playing a pivotal role later on, but look the, the the dialogue between these two is completely awesome and I just I felt like it was really funny really snappy and really witty and the chemistry between the two of them is just completely epic so we see the relationship between the young lady and the PI kind of develop and we kind of see how they interact with each other uh, through this series of events and dialogue that happen in the strip bar and then we move over to another bar where the young lady then finds the PI in a photo booth and they take some photos together and in this scene there is this very interesting musical interlude which features the PI singing this really cool song um, and playing the guitar it's lovely however as extended as it might be it was really neat to see it and the continuous movement within the film while this particular scene was shot was completely awesome so now i'm going to stop with the plot analysis and i'm going to go straight into my thoughts on the film so in 2016 dennis huck who is the writer and director of this film decided to make his first feature and too late happened to be it it was a really decently written and really awesomely directed film. Uh, upon doing some research while looking at the stats for the film, I found out that he, he made this film with 22 consecutive long shots and there is completely no editing within the film. It, and I, I felt like the idea of it was really creative and ingenious. Now a lot of people didn't like this film upon its debut but I beg to differ. I felt like 
the way that it was shot, the movement, the kind of like, you know, when we were floating down and we kind of are drifting through at ominous points and it's almost like we are part of the film, like maybe a, uh, maybe the, <laughs> the viewer's subjectiveness would be that of the consciousness of the PI. Like, you know how they say after you've passed on that you can see everything, all facets and all perspectives of what incidents went on within your life so I'm thinking that the director kind of took that perspective on it I'm not too sure but that's how I would like to think about it I know that a lot of people a lot of critics said that this particular director was inspired by Quentin Tarantino but you know I think that that's really uh, I'm sure he may have been inspired by Quentin Tarantino but who hasn't been inspired by somebody Tarantino was inspired by a myriad of films, so why couldn't this director be inspired by early West, by early West Craven? Um, for example, the last house on the left, because some of the shots or some of the scenery and the setup and almost the um, the air of the dialogue, the, it kind of reminded me of the randomness of the beginning conversations in the last house on the left. In that respect, I kind of felt like his first attempt at his first feature-length film, 35mm, was completely creative and really well done and really well shot. And I felt like the, the ending and the wraparound of the story, how everything kind of fused together and connected, was really well done. Not too many films, even mainstream big-budget films by well-known directors, have the ability to do something like that and I think one main point that I'm always talking about is the fact that writers kind of try to pull the loop-de-loop -loop on their audiences intelligence level and this film doesn't do that I don't know how someone be could be so critically harsh on the film that tried to take into consideration one creativity and two the audiences and their viewers intelligence level I think that Taking the route that a lot of critics do when looking and critiquing a film such as this is kind of ridiculous compared to what has usually been put out to the masses and celebrated widely. It's, you know, it's kind of a miss. Although at the beginning of the film you may get kind of weirded out, I would suggest to anybody to just keep watching because there are many elements and very funny, witty, and snappy moments within this film that will make you appreciate it for what it is. It uh, To me, I felt like it was a real work of art and something that we haven't really been able to see in a really long time. Um, all of the actors that... <laughs> All of the actors that were within the film, I felt like they did a super job. And just a real quick note, Jeff Fahey was extremely funny. I don't even know where he, I guess when you become more mature, you're just able to let go. But Jeff Fahey was completely amazing and really funny. I also felt like the main character, the super job, is just kind of being an aloof PI, but having a big heart and having a sense of purpose while doing what he needed to do within the film. But everybody did a very, a very, very nice job, very well done script, and I give it an A++. I think the director did a really good job, and if it were, I'd like to see anybody else who was a critic make their first film and make it as watchable as Too Late was. So, if you're into films that have a little twist, if you're into films that actually wrap up nicely, and where the dialogue is witty, where the characters are decent, where you can feel emotion coming out of the film, where things might not come together at first, but then they make you feel like you watched something that was important. So, if you're into films that make you feel like you haven't wasted your hour and 56 minutes, on something you've been watching, then I would suggest highly to watch Too Late. And I hope you enjoyed this video. And as always, until next time, if you're into it, watch it.